if you're reading a book you love and you come to a part that you love, read it out loud to yourself and like internalize why it works for you. Because there's like you get all these nuances of language and musicality and rhythm that become really, really apparent when you articulate them out loud that aren't quite as obvious when they're just in your brain, but they're still working. It's just, it's just like, it's like, it's like, you know, brushing the dirt away from the dinosaur bones. You can see it clearly when you say it out loud. What is up, everybody? You're listening to episode 39 of SFF Addicts. I'm your host, Adrian M. Gibson, and welcome to your weekly dive into the world of science fiction, fantasy, and writing craft. Joining me, as always, is my co-host, the Chewy to my Han Solo, the Joker to my Commander Shepard, MJ Kuhn. How are you, MJ? Hello. I'm doing fantastic. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. (laughs) And uh, the official SFF Addicts Patreon and merch store are now live, so check the links in the description to support what we do. You can get access to patron exclusive bonus episodes, author readings, and more. And you can purchase t-shirts, mugs, notebooks, and all kinds of cool swag. Also, don't forget to rate and review the podcast on your favorite podcast app and subscribe to the Fanfatic YouTube channel where this and every other episode of the show is available in full video. Also, a special shout out to our new patrons, Max Brown, Matthew Murphy, Christopher R. Dubois, and Jonathan Nevere, friend of the show. You're all amazing and thank you for contributing to what we do here. And now, welcoming today's guest. Travis Baldry. How are you, Travis? I'm doing wonderfully. How are you? I'm doing great. Excellent. Yeah. Excited to have you here. Hell yeah. I'm excited to be here. Actually, I edited you for Wizards, Warriors, and Words. I think oh, that's a weird oh. thing to say that I edited you. That is weird. <laughs> I edited you. <laughs> was that like the, I feel like that was like the penultimate episode or something too. It was close to the end. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was editing and producing that show. And you did a two-parter with Dirk and, uh, and Jed. So it's mm-hmm. like, I'm a little bit familiar with you, but we're going to get into some <laughs> fun stuff today. <laughs> we're already like a minute and a half in and I'm weirding the fuck out of you, but it's... <laughs> no, just, just, keep, just keep driving off-road. Yeah, nothing Beautiful. else would feel right, Adrian. <laughs> of course. So just to start this off, this is part one of a two-part chat with Travis, but to give listeners and viewers a better sense of the real Travis Baldry, tell us a bit <laughs> about yourself. Um, I grew up on a dairy. Um, I spent uh, several decades making video games. Um, I was pretty good at it, but eventually I started narrating audiobooks on the side because my kids didn't need me to read to them anymore, and I decided I liked that a lot <laughs> more. And so I switched. Um, uh, and I've been a professional audiobook narrator for. I guess three three years full time now at this mm-hmm. point. Uh, several years part time before that. Um, last year during National Novel Writing Month, I decided that I would try and actually complete one after a, just a wasteland of failed attempts. <laughs> and um, instead of doing something serious or important or like the Great American Novel, I basically had a joke idea, which was, "What if a Hallmark movie was set in the Forgotten Realms?" And uh, so I did that, and it was fun, and I had a good time, and I thought I would release it um, to see if I could make enough money to pay back my cover artist. <laughs> and, uh, and then things went very unexpectedly, and now I'm sitting here on this, on this podcast. I love Man, it. What a trajectory. Well, uh, let's, let's dig a little bit deeper into the past. What was your fantasy and sci-fi gateway drug like how did you get into these genres and reading and that kind of stuff um i read a lot when i was a kid because i lived on the aforementioned dairy in the middle of nowhere there wasn't a lot there it was the middle of texas um um there were lots of cows and uh (laughs) but my my um my grandmother had been a science teacher at the local very very small school and she had all of these books left over from both her son and from like the library, when the library would like turn over and buy new books, mm-hmm. they would just have a whole bunch that they would get rid of. So she just had shelves of these things, like all these old, Amazing. weird, you know, weird, like when Grimm's fairy tales were not edited. <laughs> and uh, the good stuff, you know, the, right. 
I remember I read a series called like Freddy the Pig and was like all these stories about Freddy the Pig and he's like a detective or he's a cowboy or is, you know, <laughs> a, whatever. Um, I really loved that this kind of off the wall, weird, fantastical stuff. Mm -hmm. And my uncle had left behind his copy of The Hobbit and his copy of Dune. And I picked those up at a very early age, much earlier than I probably should have. Um, and I've, I mean, I've liked fantasy ever since. I also kind of grew up in the 80s where mm -hmm. fantasy movies were kind of a big deal. You know, there was a whole lot. There's just that all that culture kind of at the same time. Um, when I grew up um, and actually started making video games, a lot of the games I made were basically fantasy video games. So um, I, I'm probably best known for making Torchlight, Torchlight 2. Mm -hmm. That's me. And those are very like... Diablo slash Dungeons and Dragons adjacent fantasy properties. So I've been kind of immersed in making fantasy stuff for most of my adult life, one way or another. Um, and when I got into audiobooks, I actually didn't think I would be reading anything like that. I figured it was only people yeah. with British accents. Um, <laughs> I figured I would be doing like thrillers and like mysteries and, you know, detective stuff because yeah. I kind of have yeah. that sort of voice. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not actually how it worked out. I eventually ended up doing um, Will White's Cradle series, which is the thing I'm probably best known for in audiobooks, which is enormously popular. And anybody listening to this probably knows what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and they're great. And it's this, it's this very kind of Western style of fantasy that's very, like, it's got a really conversational voice. It sounds right when it's read by somebody with an American accent. Yeah, And uh, there's more and more of this kind of lit RPG, game lit, and progress progression fantasy fiction that's really popular right now. So I do just buttloads of it, um, <laughs> which is the technical term. Um, <laughs> anyway, so that's I guess that's kind of like my arc and experience with fantasy, both like, you know, just as a kid, all the way to being a professional. Mm-hmm. I love it. So you talked a little bit about, you know, getting involved in kind of creating fantasy stories through video games. But what inspired you to start writing uh, it in novel form? Was this the first, you know, nano that you'd participated in or? I want to say it's my eighth. Um, OK. I think oh, I have yeah. some chunk of a fantasy novel I tried to write in high school. You know, I was really big into the Wheel of Time. You know, it's just that whole era of the 90s when Daryl Sweet did the painting on every freaking paperback. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I had my pretentious, ridiculous, awful, you know, fantasy novel that I was writing. I think I wrote the glossary first. You know, all the <laughs> stupid, unpronounceable words. Got those out it. of the way right <laughs> up front. <laughs> So that I could insert them annoyingly all throughout. Um, <laughs> anyway, it was very bad. But I was I always wanted to write. I like. I don't think you'd become a narrator unless you like words and you like books and you like language. Um, mm -hmm. So I always wanted to write a novel. And uh, as I said, wasteland of NaNoWriMo projects. It's like seven or seven or eight times, I think I would always get to like the middle, the crappy middle. Yes. Um, and then I would and I would tap out. I was convinced that I was a pantser. Mm -hmm. And for anybody who doesn't know, a pantser is somebody who doesn't outline. They just yeah. let the words flow from their fingers and the story Fucking moves through it. them. And it's all very transcendent and amazing. <laughs> and that's how it should be. And I, I wish that was the way that it was for me, but it is not. So this is also like the, the first book that I outlined. Of <laughs> <laughs> this yeah. is the first book that I outlined. And it's amazing how much fucking easier it is if you actually have a plan. <laughs> Right, when you use yeah. the process that works for you, right? <laughs> oh my God, I know where I'm going before I write it. I don't have to figure out where this is going in the middle of the goddamn chapter. Yeah. Who would have thought? Anyway, but it felt like an admission of failure too. It was like, I'm not some sort of transcendent, transcendent right? word Wizard. artist. I actually yeah. have to sit here and mechanically build this shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so complicated, um, man. <laughs> Right? There's a lot to weave is, together. <laughs> I mean, I spent years being an engineer. I should have known this about myself. I built software for decades. I mean, yeah. you don't just sit down and just let the code flow. You plan out what you're going to do and you build it in, you know, it's a methodical construction, you know, like a real, like a, like a real person. <laughs> like a real person. <laughs> now I'm going to really piss off people who actually can pants. There's all these pants out there that are like, what the, what the fuck, dude? Oh yeah. my god. We just no, you're all just amazing and I'm jealous of you. That's really what this amounts to. I'm yes. just <laughs> jealous of everybody who can pants. <laughs> desperately, desperately jealous. Me too. But you uh, you know, it's really interesting coming from your video game background, 
you know, which is much more this like coding and the software side of things. How did you kind of transition into, okay, you got an outline for Legends and Lattes. What was your inspiration for that book? And then how did you apply your knowledge from your video game experience into that book? Um, so it was probably two things. I think, I think I got a lot out of my audiobook experience, weirdly. And um, I think there's a lot of like structural, I don't want to get too nerdy here. I don't, there's a lot of like how you work experience, especially if you work for yourself that really mm -hmm. applies well to writing. Um, so being able to sit down and do the work and follow the plan mm -hmm. um, and complete my words and complete my chapter and then do it again the next day and just put my butt in the chair and do it is just a, a skill that you have to do if you're going to write a whole lot of software and debug it and ship it <laughs> on yeah. any sort of time scale, especially when there's like mm -hmm. millions of dollars at stake. You just kind of learn to be able to do that. So that's, that's really great, especially if you have an outline. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that, that felt like that was a good like skill transfer that really helped me out. Um, the other one is, and I was talking to somebody about this earlier today, I write pretty clean for the same reason that I write, when you write software, like I had a rule, like the build is always works at the end of the day. You never leave it broken because as mm -hmm. soon as you leave the build broken, things start to rot. It's like, oh, well, we can't really address that problem right now because nothing's working quite right. We'll get around to it and then you make mm -hmm. more stuff, but it probably doesn't work right either, but you can't tell because things are broken. And, then and so excuses, once you start building on this sort of busted foundation, things get more and more and more off kilter. And by the time mm -hmm. you actually get things working and you try and address the problems, they're just daunting. And yeah. you're looking at this big pile of crap that you have to sift through. <laughs> so I was really um, conscientious when I write about this hangs together. If I've introduced something that requires a logical change earlier in the book, I do it right now. There's no, I'll get to it later. I'll fix it mm -hmm. in post. I'll, I'll get this during the edit. If it, it's whatever is there now is what my current belief is. This is the best version of what I've got. Mm. Um, that I don't know of anything busted. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that for me, that's really useful because when I got to the end, the book that I wrote is largely the book that went out. It definitely got edited. I definitely went mm -hmm. through and tightened language, but structurally the book didn't change. I think I added two scenes and they were brief ones just to like to extend some conversations. Nice. That was it. The book was yeah. the book, which was nice because I don't like rewriting things either. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was great. Um, from the audiobook side of things, one of the cool things about being an audiobook narrator is that you know, as a writer, when they say that the best way to edit your work is to read it out loud, it's like a really mm -hmm. common refrain. Well, reading other people's work out loud is also incredibly instructive, especially yeah. if you do it for thousands of hours every single day forever. Good books, bad books, mediocre books, because it's basically this incredibly instructive um, study in what you personally like and what you personally yeah. are okay with and what works for you. Because if I'm reading a book on a page and something is boring, I just skim it, right? I don't even really mm -hmm. register it. I'm just going to glance. I'm just, uh, okay, yeah, they're talking about the rugs and there's the carpets. And, oh, yeah, now it's the silverware. <laughs> okay, now where something's happening again. Well, if you're reading it as an audiobook, you can't do that. You have to invest meaning into every freaking word. And if you exactly. don't like those words or you don't feel that they're doing the job that they need to do, you have to get out and push. So whenever you have to get out and push, it becomes really apparent to you, this part doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. And then conversely, if something works really well and you feel like you're just dancing on air and it's just like, God, this is incredible, you take note of why. So that's not like, I don't feel like that's necessarily like an objective measure, but it's certainly like really clarifying for your personal taste as a writer and what kind of stuff you want to read. And instead of figuring out that later when you're reading your own book again, you're like, God, this is boring as shit. What are those? <laughs> I, why don't I even write this chapter? <laughs> you, you've already kind of like internalized that lesson about what you like. And I found that just amazingly helpful. The other thing it's really great for is writing dialogue. Because you're already, Definitely. there's something that happens when you read over and over out loud. You start rewiring in your brain how words on a page sound in your head. Like, when I read right now, it's very distinctly my voice in my brain or the voices of the characters doing the thing in real time in a way that mm -hmm. it didn't used to be. It felt a lot murkier to me before I was a narrator. 
So having that weird superpower while you're writing is super, super helpful. <laughs> I'm not like trying to toot my own horn and say that my writing is really great or anything, but just as far as like the things that I struggled with, it, those are obstacles that got made less by that process. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it's like for anyone who's obviously not everyone is an audiobook narrator, but it helps to read your stuff out loud, regardless of where you're at as a writer, just to hear how stuff sounds out loud. It's like, oh, yeah. it's, you can well, like hear you the said, flaws so stuff. glaringly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm well, another thing I think is useful. If you're reading a book you love and you come to a part that you love, read it out loud to yourself and like internalize mm -hmm. why it works for you. Because there's like you get all these nuances of language and musicality and rhythm that mm -hmm. become really, really apparent when you articulate them out loud that aren't quite as obvious when they're just in your brain, but they're still working. It's just it's just like it's like it's like, you know, brushing the dirt away from the dinosaur bones. You can see it clearly when you say it out loud. Just got to use a fine brush for that, though. Very fine. There you go. Yeah, a little paintbrush. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So the audiobook narration sounds like it gave you like a great picture of what you liked and what you didn't like in fiction, which helps you, you know, create your own. Mm -hmm. uh, the concept of cozy fantasy, this like high fantasy, low stakes that we have going on in Legends and Lattes. Um, is that something that you'd encountered through narration or through reading? Or was it just uh, an, an idea that you had uh, for something a little different because clearly we found that people, people, including myself for sure, are like craving this. We're so hungry for something that is Everyone fantasy needs a warm world, hug. but is like feels like reading a <laughs> hug. Like it's incredible. <laughs> I got to read, I got to narrate a few books that I think kind of are in this genre. I don't think anything had been really called out as that, or at least they were adjacent. Mm -hmm. Um, some fantasy romance stuff that I really enjoyed by the author Forthright. And she also has some YA books um, called Galleries of Stone. Uh, the first one was Meadows Sweet. I don't, I can't remember if I read Meadows Sweet before I did this book or not. But even the fantasy romance stuff, I, I don't get a lot of that. That doesn't come my way as an audiobook narrator very often, but I really like it. And mm -hmm. I call them like chicken soup books because they just felt good to do. <laughs> like I felt... It was so pleasant to do. The characters were so gentle. I, they finished the book and I felt nice. And it was, it's a nice way to feel. But I don't get that very often as a narrator. Mostly I get like power fantasy stuff. Some dude <laughs> in his 20s who's kind of a douchebag and probably has a snarky <laughs> sidekick. And he's going to evolve a little as a character. And there'll be some token people who are female, maybe, as long as it doesn't turn off their audience. And, you know... At, I do a lot of that. And sometimes they're really, really, really fun. And there's great ones. And, um, but when I was going to write, I was like, you know what? I really don't want to write that. I want to write yeah. what I've been <laughs> craving, which is mm -hmm. something that makes me feel good. It's also like the height of COVID. Um, and the idea of going to a coffee shop and seeing other people's faces is also the height of escapist fantasy for me at the yeah, time. Definitely. Um, so I initially did, thought of the idea as a joke. It was like a total like, you know, wink to the camera idea, which was Hallmark movie in the Forgotten Realms. And I, I remember the moment I had the idea, I was narrating live, which is how I work most of the time. And I was talking to people in my discord and I was like, you know, what I really want is this Hallmark fantasy movie. And it's going to be about like, there's this dwarf lady and she's like an executive and she has to go back to her dad's failing mine <laughs> and she has to fix things. And she's really cranky about it. And there's all the townsfolk, but also there's like this really ruggedly handsome guy who probably bakes cookies and he has like a sweater. <laughs> and, you know, I, it was just total cliche Hallmark movie thing. And I was like, yeah, I want something like that. And obviously that's not what I write. I, I, I sat down to outline it and I was like, oh, I'll make something I actually, <laughs> maybe a little less jokey. But even when I wrote the first chapter, I was like, okay, this is going to be probably a little funny and it's going to be clear I'm doing this. And then mm -hmm. I totally didn't do that at all. I was just immediately <laughs> started writing it in earnest and it became very earnest for me and it became really personal for me and I didn't expect that at all. So it was like a weird left turn right after I started. Um, because the book is about somebody in their 40s who has been doing the same job for most of their life 
stops doing it, switches to another career and discovers a whole community of people they didn't know were there and that they really needed. Mm -hmm. And I, as someone who spent decades making video games until his 40s and then stopped and switched to another career in audiobook narration and found, a, you know, a whole group of people I didn't know were, that were there that were really supportive and wonderful. Of course, I don't relate to this at all. But um, <laughs> so it ended up, again, it ended up being really, really personal. Um, and uh I think that's part of the reason I was actually able to finish it, honestly, was because I related to it, um, yeah. which became more apparent to me when I wrote the second book. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Confirmed here, <laughs> Travis uh, wrote an autobiography called Legends and Lances. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In, it, I play, in it, I play an orc. Yes. A, li a lady orc. <laughs> But you, uh, I love it. <laughs> fantasy. That's what it's all about. That was the man. other thing. I wanted to do a protagonist that was nothing like what I get to narrate. I was like, who, who could be the protagonist of this that I will never get to narrate? I want mm -hmm. someone, some want something that I want to read that is not something I'm going to get to do. So, yeah. And you, you brought up the, the, the coffee shop vibe earlier, but also kind of like we're in the pandemic and everyone's kind of missing this social element. And I feel like what a lot of people are craving is community. And that's something that you touched on in Legends and Lattes, and you really, really focused in on it with the community that built around this coffee shop. But for you, mm -hmm. why was coffee and, and cafe culture appealing in that sense? And why did it work for this book? Um, I had a coffee shop right before the pandemic. I, I lived in Seattle. And we had a local coffee shop called El Diablo. It was a Cuban coffee joint. I went there for like 15 years. It, you know, our family would go there. We knew everybody. You know, people came and went, but they had all those classic elements of a coffee shop. Um, and it was just, uh, it was a constant for us. And we really missed it. It closed during the pandemic, which was very sad. Um, but I've, I like that part of the day, that little secondary community that you can be a part of, you know. And the smells and the food, it's just, it's a great place to be. I like it. Um, and so my initial idea was just, you know, to incorporate those things and have, have this feeling like assembling that. Um, mm. I mean, it root, the book is kind of like, it's a combination of like the great British Bake Off and Fixer Upper. <laughs> it's like, yeah, somebody called it like, kind of like progression fantasy, because it's basically this assembling of something. Business progression. This, this, this inevitable assembling of something that is very satisfying to read. It's like a weird dopamine hit. It's like wa while watching <laughs> one of those home renovation shows. Oh, look, they're banging out the wall. How's this going to look? And at the end, when it all comes together, mm. it's just very viscerally satisfying. Yeah. And the same thing with like the baking show, right? Watching yeah. them, you know, struggle. And then all of a sudden there's this cool cake they made. It's weirdly viscerally satisfying. The other thing that's, that's true about both of those is that they both have drama, but it's not mean. Mm -hmm. It's not about somebody dying. It's not about somebody failing. It's not about somebody betraying someone else. There's absolutely drama there, but it's someone's personal struggles and how other people like intersect that. So the idea that you can have drama that doesn't have to be awful mm -hmm. <laughs> is also very comforting. And it's one of the reasons I, that yeah. those shows are comforting for me. I can get invested in the outcome, but I know it's not going to, the house is not going to collapse at the end of Fixer Upper. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. even if somebody gets booted off the Great British Baking Show, everybody else is going to be absolute angels about it. Right. So, they're all going to come and hug them. They're all going to hug them. <laughs> and, you know, nobody's going to be hurt. You know, it's going to be right. yeah. nice. So like, a lot of those things kind of found their way their into it. And they kind of merged with the coffee thing. You know, um, I wanted to, to have that kind of like fish out of water thing. And so like in like... <laughs> It's almost like a joke in fantasy novels. They've always got some analog for coffee, right? It's claw or calf mm. or somebody. Yeah. And you know it's coffee. You can just know <laughs> it's, it's all coffee, coffee man. So it's just coffee. fucking put in the goddamn coffee. So um, these calf beans. Fucking calf man. beans. You know, it's just yeah. like, it's, it's just coffee, my dude. <laughs> well, speaking of a fish out of water, let's get into your indie pub journey with Legends and Lattes in terms of this was the first book that you finished and entered into the space with. Mm -hmm. Why did you decide initially indie pub is the direction that I'm going to go? And then how did you kind of approach that from the beginning in terms of learning the ropes of self-pub and, and promoting mm -hmm. yourself and all that kind of stuff. So uh, because I work with tons of indie authors, I kind of wanted to see things from their side 
I wanted mm-hmm. to go through the process on their end because I figured, you know, it would kind of inform my job as a narrator and, yeah. you know, how I thought about the work that they gave me and the kind of struggles they would have and how maybe I could do things better or, or whatever. Um, and also I just thought it would be fun to learn because I like to learn stuff. And I finished mm-hmm. the, the book. Finally, I finished a goddamn book. I might as well publish it because <laughs> I can. Yeah. Right and now. I have the tools and the know-how. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, as soon as it was going to get finished, I was like, yeah, I'm definitely going to do this. I'm going to go through this process and I want to learn about it. And I wrote it all up. I have like some, I don't know how many thousand word medium article that goes through everything I did. And I tried to lay out all this information <laughs> that I assembled when I researched to figure out how to go about this. So I've got a background in like commissioning art from games. So I commissioned a cover, which turned out really great. Okay. And um, I did my initial edit myself. And then I bartered with an author that I work with, who was also an editor, to get a professional edit done. Perfect. Um, and we did it in a very non-standard way. It was very slow. We do, we do a chapter a day. And it's a very thorough edit because she's just as anal retentive as I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so she would send me her notes and edits on one chapter at the end of the day and I would respond to them. And as I'm doing it, I'm like, I start internalizing the edits. Cause so my mm-hmm. goal is not to just do the big edit and be exhausted at the end, but it's to figure out what's changing. Like, why are these edits happening? What's, what are we doing and what are we tweaking and why? And then I started editing ahead. So before I would send a chapter, I would edit within, with in mind what she had already done. So I'm trying to make these right. lessons apply. And fix them in my brain so the next time I write a book, maybe there will be less of the same issues or I'll be cognizant of them or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was really useful. It took about, I think we took about a month to edit it. That's um, solid though. I was say, yeah, that's uh, still a good timeline. <laughs> and then during that time, the, the art for the cover is going. Um, so that gets finished and I figure out how to do all of the ebook layout and the print layout and everything else. I tried everything but vellum because vellum was expensive and then discovered that I should just fucking use vellum. <laughs> so <laughs> any other way money. that you could lay out an ebook, I have tried it and they were all <laughs> awful. Um, either they would look great in one thing and then everything else, like an image would be, you know, 40 times bigger and the text mm. would break and anyway. Vellum. It's fabulous. Just <laughs> freaking use Vellum. Um, just buy it. <laughs> just get Vellum. Um, uh, and uh, I, I enjoyed the process. It's kind of fun to put something together and assemble it. Um, so uh, I also started thinking about like the launch. And I, I, I do everything like I'm going to do it for real. <laughs> Any hobby, I do it like I'm going to do it for real, which is why so many of my hobbies have become my jobs. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I researched how I was going to release it in print because I wanted to do it on Amazon. But I also really wanted to go down to my neighborhood bookstore and get them to at least order one copy so mm-hmm. I could take one photo of it sitting on their shelf before it never sold. So um, I also uh, looked into Ingram Spark and all the other print pub options where you can conceivably maybe get a brick and mortar to carry your book. And it cost $45 to do, and it's slow and clunky and lame, but I did it. And I did mm-hmm. it just because of that. And it turned out to be really important later that I did that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I got everything kind of set. I have everything, every, and, and I finally got my final cover art, and I did all the text layout and everything else, and built all, put together all the interior art and stuff. And I had my book, and I posted the image to Twitter, and Sean and McGuire saw it and liked it and tweeted about it. And then, all of a sudden I got a bunch of interest and it was only on the cover. It's only on the strength of the cover, which to be fair is a really good cover. It is. It sets up, it, it articulates the concept pretty succinctly. It's you, you know, it's going to have probably a little bit of sapphic romance and it's obviously, it's not going to be about anything but a coffee shop and cooking. And the tagline lets you know, it's no high stakes whatsoever. And it's just, you you can see what it's going to be. Um, and so I thought, Oh crap, I better turn on the pre-orders. And so I did. Um, and the pre-orders did really well. And <laughs> then I, I sent out the book to, um, I just set up like a Google, like survey and set up like a thing for arcs and it filled up with like a hundred arcs pretty quick. And I mm-hmm. sent them out. Um, and then people read them, which was also surprising. So, um, launch day came around and a bunch of people actually posted reviews and posted reviews on Goodreads and posted them on Amazon. and. <laughs> tweeted about it again and then sean and mcguire got the book 
and liked the book and said that she liked the book and more more people piled in and then it became kind of this this engine of like book talk and you know booktube and all of the other mm -hmm. book book slash social media isms mm -hmm. um <laughs> where it sort of self-perpetuated <laughs> itself and people would recommend it to each other and it started to yes. proliferate got some buzz um, uh, and then it got in Barnes and Noble and that was weird. And I learned about, so here's my understanding of how this happened. Um, obviously, uh, people who are selling books at Barnes and Noble are on social media too. And mm -hmm. if they see a book that they like, that's indie, normally they can't order it in the store policy will just be, no, you can't. But I guess there's a workaround, which is that if you order it for yourself into a Barnes and Noble, and then you cancel it once it arrives in the store, it converts to store stock that you can Ooh. sell. Sneaky. So several cool. booksellers cool. did that. They used the loophole, <laughs> ordered it in, canceled, converted to stock, and then hand sold it. And then once some copies sell, wow. they can go to the manager and say, oh, we're selling copies yeah. of these. Can we just order some in? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Booksellers are the best. I love yes, them. Yes. Booksellers are amazing. <laughs> I owe so much to booksellers. Brilliant. And once that happens, like all the Barnes and Nobles I gather are kind of like in sort of like little local networks. There's mm -hmm. so many like regional stores between cities that all talk to each other and know each other. And then it can like proliferate between those little nests of stores. Mm -hmm. And then it was basically just in all of them over like a relatively short period of time. Um, so uh, on... From my surveying I did before I launched, because I gathered lots of information, um, it seems like mostly <laughs> on Amazon, people sell like maybe one to three percent of their sales or paperbacks compared to their ebook. That mm -hmm. seemed to be what people mostly agreed it was about, you know, with some variance, but around there. Mine was equal. Wow. wow. It was basically, it was just equivalent between ebooks and paperbacks. I sold about the same number. Um, and then I sold way more in bookstores, but it started to go up. Because as it started to proliferate, it started to like escalate. Mm -hmm. So somewhere around in here, th this is my already self pub is way more than I expected. I'm so happy. I'm could not have imagined it was going to happen, and I'm very grateful. So I'm like, well, this could, this went better than it possibly could. And now I'm going to go back to my cave and I'll do my audiobook thing and let this putter <laughs> on in the background. And it was a great, it was a great experiment. And I got struck by lightning. Hooray! This was this oh, was amazing. you wish, you wish. Um, <laughs> what? Um, then several agents reached out to me and I guess this, this is the switch to traditional yeah. publishing. Yeah. I can just keep like monologuing here, but if you have questions, you just, I love it. I mean, it's so funny because that was the next question that I was going to ask. You segued for us, man. <laughs> yeah. So this is like the transition point. Um, yeah, yeah. uh, several agents contacted me and I don't know anything about it. Right. I, I, I don't know how to pick an agent. I don't know anything about traditional publishing and I certainly didn't consider it. It was not something I thought about at all. But at this point, I'm like, well, when's this opportunity ever going to come around again where I can do it both yeah. ways and see which one I like better with no yeah. real risk, right? I don't risk anything. This isn't, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to quit my job to do this. I like my job. I'm not, tr I'm not working, you know, bussing tables, wishing to God I could become a writer. Mm -hmm. This was fun for me and I really enjoyed it. But if this doesn't work out, you know, it's, right. it's fine. Audiobooks. <laughs> so, um, so I decided to do it and I just, I talked to them on Zooms and I just went for the person I kind of vibed with the most because I didn't have anything else to go on. Mm -hmm. I think that's um, a good that's thing a good to way go to on, do though. it though. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, yeah. Uh, their name is Stevie Finnegan. She's, uh, she's uh, an agent with Zeno in the UK and she lives on a narrow boat. She's awesome. Um, Sounds awesome. Anyway, so I said <laughs> yes. Um, and then I, she went out immediately and put feelers out on the book. And I think within 48 hours, Tour UK had like a timed offer. And I'm already kind of like, oh, because I Tour to me is like, Tour is pretty amazing. They uh, always yeah. seem to treat their <laughs> books well. They choose well. They do good covers. They're, they care about genre fiction. And I'm all, there's just such a breadth of stuff that they do, you know? Yeah. Um, I love Tour. So I'm like, oh, that sounds amazing. <laughs> um, and, you know, I had, like the weekend to think it over and said, what the hell, why not? Who else would I possibly go with? And it was a nice offer, um, you know, much more than I expected. So I said, yes. 
Um, I didn't actually know that Tor UK and Tor US were different, actually, because I don't know anything about the publishing industry at all. Um, (laughs) So um, I just assumed that that's just Tor everywhere. (laughs) But it's not. So um, uh, make the agreement with Tor UK and then, you know, they're going to go out and do foreign rights, which I learned all about because I didn't know anything about foreign rights either. Um, so they set it out for, for bidding for other territories with the U S being the main one. And this is, this is extremely surreal to me. So tour UK and tour us and St. Martin's press and all these other publishers are all owned by Macmillan. They're all owned by the same mega corporation, Mm -hmm. but they still have to bid against (laughs) each other for rights from themselves (laughs) <laughs> even though they're all owned by Macmillan. So yeah. like Tor US and, and St. Martin's are both bidding to buy the rights from Tor UK, which is, and they're all owned by the same company. It just seems so strange <laughs> to me. It's just so bizarre. Um, but then Tor US wanted to pick it up in the US and um, I, I really liked talking to them as well. So Tor US got the, the US rights. Mm-hmm. Um, and then started a process that actually took longer than writing, editing, and publishing the book, which was just to sign the paperwork. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that That's I don't think we finished doing you. that until like June. <laughs> you know, we didn't finish doing that till like June. And Tor US is like literally copy editing the book before they've even signed anything because they have so Crazy. little time to work with. Yeah. So they're just they just all hands on deck getting stuff done. Um, and. Uh, I really liked working with, with everybody. It was really nice. I was kind of worried going in because you, I had this preconceived notion that working with the publisher was going to be like giving up control, mm. like giving up like um, my say in the edit and my say in the text that it would be like, well, the editor says we're going to do this and you will do it or you will take a hike. But that's not the way it worked at all. They were, it was, they felt really collaborative and really their stance was always we're going to make these we're going to make some suggestions but ultimately this is your book and we want you to be happy with it so you you need to look at everything that we ever suggest from that standpoint which was surprising to me um i'm a super nerd so you know can i and i have a history of like fixing bugs <laughs> so <laughs> my approach to editing is maybe is maybe a little I get the sense that my approach to editing is like a little less precious than what they're used to having worked with authors in general, because Mm -hmm. I'm, I spent 20 years shipping video games and reading video game forums and the comments section. So my skin is basically asbestos at this point. I'm almost immune to being (laughs) like offended or hurt or, you know, uh, deeply wounded by the fact that somebody doesn't like something or, or has an opinion about it. So all that stuff is kind of done and it's just like, how do I problem solve this? Mm -hmm. You know, this is potentially an issue. Maybe I don't like your suggestion, but I can see what you're trying to say. So let's try and take this tack. Anyway, I, I found the whole process actually great. And because I'd already really rigorously edited beforehand, we didn't have much to do for the, the public, the republication. Like a handful of words changed. Change was, Several things I changed just because I wanted to. There was like mm-hmm. a few words I wanted to do a little bit differently or that were too, they were the same and too proximate. Um, and then it was things like, I'm from the South. So when you drag something in the past sense for, tense for me, that's a drug. Everybody else is dragged. But I say <laughs> drug. So whenever I, yeah, no, those have been changed that's to Derek, drag. That's Derry coming um, back. <laughs> it's Derry. It's the Derry coming back. Um, so it was really very little because it was, we did a, we did a really thorough edit. Um, anyway, so the editing process went great. There's copy editing changes. Like there's a house, everybody has a house style. Yeah. Um, like when we did an initial edit, like if an ellipsis ends a sentence, it's four periods, but if it's like mid sentence, it's three. Apparently this is actually an appropriate style in certain circumstances, but Tor's is always three. Mm -hmm. Tor never uses N dashes, only M dashes. So they never have any, they never do both. Well, I had N's and M's. So there's all these little style things that change. (laughs) Um, some people treat like book excerpts and titles with different, like uh, different specific treatment you know, for their specific house style. So we kind of like resolved those things. Um, but it was, it was just not that big of a deal. Um, but after, but after everything's said and done, it's like the book got re-released and, and you, 
you kind of came into it at the beginning, like, I'm just going to dip my toes in both pools and see yeah. what the fucking difference is. But for you, what, in hindsight now, having experienced both, what were the biggest challenges when it comes to self pub versus trad pub, or can you kind of compare and mm-hmm. contrast the two? For me, I think the biggest challenge in self pub is just assembling all the information you need because mm. all of the information you need to do the job and to get it done is out there, but it's very seldom in like a central repository. So there's a certain amount right. of just researching and talking to people and assembling this information, but it's not that bad. And because the stink is sort of off self pub now, there's no reason not to self pub. I mean, if I went back to the beginning and I knew nothing that I knew now and I started over, I would still do self pub first. Um, partially because I don't, I feel like if you have any success in self pub, you can probably make a switch if you want to. There's so many hybrid authors now who do mm-hmm. self pub and trad pub. Yep. I, I feel like that barrier is so thin. There's yeah. so many books that have converted from indie to trad too, like Senlin Ascends and Rage of Dragons and The Atlas mm-hmm. Six and, you know, on and on. More and more, things just kind of like jump the fence when it seems appropriate. <laughs> so I would still probably go self-pub first. The advantages of self-pub are a nimbleness, obviously, because <laughs> you can do things a lot faster even than you can complete the paperwork in trad pub. Right. And yeah. you can find out if it works and you can move on. And it's very satisfying to be able to just act and just mm-hmm. do yeah. And to immediately True. see in a response, and I've got Amazon graphs, and I can see exactly when a social media post influences sales or mm-hmm. whatever, and I can track things over time. And that's really satisfying if you're a data wonk at all, is to be able to watch things happen. And that's, mm-hmm. that's really cool. Um, being able to get on an Amazon sale or do your own sale or, or whatever, and then fiddle the numbers and watch it happen, super cool. Obviously, you can't do that in trad. Um, so I think that nimbleness is really powerful and it's a great way to just like test out a book. I mean, you want to wait like Definitely. a year and a half to find out if anybody likes your book or do you want to or find now. out next month and then change and iterate and do something else as if it didn't work. Like mm-hmm. if I were going into this as like my actual career from the get go, that would obviously be the way that I would want to do it. I would want to fire off a book, see what the response was. If it didn't mm-hmm. go well, analyze why, and then immediately do it again and try something yeah. different and iterate. I don't think you can iterate that way in trad pub because it's like, oh, well, you know, 12 or 13 uh, months from now, we'll see how it does, you know, so <laughs> it doesn't, long. You, yes. you can't, you can't iterate nimbly. So I think there's a ton of value in that. On the flip side in trad pub, there's things that you're just otherwise not going to do as an indie, probably like the likelihood that I would hire a foreign rights lawyer and get translation done was, you know, basically zero. I was not going to do that. But right. now the book will be translated into, I don't know how many languages now, 11 or 12 so far. It, they keep oh, popping cool. up. So <laughs> I would that would never happen in any other circumstance. Mm-hmm. I ran into my book in an airport and signed it in an airport. There was no way that would happen. <laughs> I managed to get into a Barnes and Nobles and that was amazing. And I got into several indie bookstores, but mm-hmm. that airport? Oh yeah, that's a bucket that's, list item that's for every crazy. I know. That's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. And there's no way I would be able to do it otherwise. Um, the other thing that you get that becomes a possibility when you're agented and trad pub is other media, graphic novels, TV, other stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to say anything about these right now, but they are <laughs> options. They're very fickle <laughs> options too. They're anyways. they're options. <laughs> Some of them are less fickle than others. Um, True. Anyway, I didn't say anything. Anyway, no. anyway. eyeball emojis are right here. <laughs> so there, there are other opportunities that show anything. up. I can that that only exist in trad pub. I, it was a really long shot, and none of us thought it would happen. But the book ended up on the NYT when at launch. So mm-hmm. again, that's something. There's no way you can actually do as an indie. It's just not possible because yeah. you can't get listed in enough um, in enough. Uh, uh, what is it? I don't remember what they call it. You know, I don't think you can get listed in enough of the right uh, lists for it to be aggregated yeah. into the calculation for that. Mm-hmm. So you can get, you can probably get on USA Today, and you might be able to get on Wapo or or whatever, but you can't get on the NYT pretty much unless you go trad pub. Right. Even if you are, you know, print and brick and mortar. So that's super cool. And the instant that happened, Sean and like sent me a. a text and it was like congratulations on your new first name (laughs) (laughs) oh my god i love it um brilliant 
So there, there's cool things on on both sides of it. Um, yeah. Also, my experience working with Tor has been universally good. They're really cool people who care about books and want to do neat things and are pleasant and nice. Mm -hmm. So far, my experience everywhere has been that book people are like super cool people. But again, I was a little worried going into traditional that it'd be like, oh, how corporate is this going to be? And it just was <laughs> not. Um, so I was, it, it's been fun to do both. That's awesome. And now that you're working on, on, I think you finished this week, the, the draft of, um, your second book, yeah, the sequel, which is bookshops and bone dust. How are you feeling mm -hmm. now? Cause it's like, you're going and continuing on the traditional path because of the success mm -hmm. of legends and lattes, both in indie and then transitioning into trad. But how have you been feeling about mm -hmm. that whole process? And, you know, MJ was uh, telling me about, I've never heard the book to squeeze, but I've heard of sophomore slump. So how, how is yeah. that whole process been? Are like you for feeling you? the book to squeeze? <laughs> so I felt a lot of different squeeze things at like a lot of different too, like, points. Sexy. <laughs> I felt a lot of different things at a lot of different points along this <laughs> process. So when I did the agreement with Tor, it was for two books. It was for the first book and the second book. And that's it. Mm -hmm. that's, what my, that's the extent of my obligation. And I was supposed to deliver my book by November 1st, I think. And I beat that. Um, and I knew exactly what I was going to write. I knew the book at the beginning. I told them what I was going to write. It was going to be a cozy mystery set in the same city. And it was going to be about this, um, she was a professor of, um, forensic, uh, thaumistry and she had left because she got passed over for the deanship. She was really mad and she went and she became a novelist living in another city. Just irate. She's this <laughs> elf. She's awesome. She's basically Helen Mirren, you know, and, um, <laughs> I love her already. <laughs> and, uh, the dean gets murdered and she has to go back. They ask her to come back and investigate his death and you find out about how magic works. And also she sets up in this bookshop that she used to like when she was a student that she buys because it closed. And, you know, um, her himbo bodyguard, you know, is, is with her and is kind of like running the bookshop and it was going to be super cool. And I outlined the thing to the hilt. It was a massive outline. I knew everything that was going to happen. And I started to write it and I, fucking hated it no i got i got like thirty thousand words into it i think and i was like i fucking hate this like i like no. the concept i like the characters but it was mm -hmm. like i don't know how to write a mystery is really what it amounted to there was mm -hmm. so much like person a has to get here person b has to get here these things have to happen for the mystery to work and everything just kind of got lost in that like it just didn't have it didn't have like the personal connection that I needed to understand how to write it. So mm -hmm. it felt dead to me. And I yeah. just, yeah. Like, and then I was horrified because I'd committed to doing it. And I was like, <laughs> oh shit. Now what? Yeah. yeah. Now what? <laughs> um, and so I let him know. I let him know. And it's like, I got to try and start over. I need to, I got to find something else. I restarted over two more failed times. So the, there was a, three books died on the way to this book. I, harvested a lot of organs from all of them <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way of putting sounds it sounds pretty right? gross but not macabre. i harvested I a lot of organs from them to make the one i want and i finally wrote it but you mentioned like the sophomore slump and the and the squeeze the second book squeeze mm -hmm. so i definitely felt awful while i was writing it for a couple of reasons and it was complicated for me for a while um i felt i felt everything felt bad but I couldn't determine whether it felt bad because the story was busted or there was something that I, that wasn't working for me. Or if I felt bad because I was worried about, that I wasn't going to meet people's expectations because the mm -hmm. previous book I wrote with no expectations whatsoever. But now I had people who were like really attached to the characters and the kind of book it was. And, oh, it's got coffee. I love coffee. And, you know, does it have a sapphic romance in it? Does it have the things that everybody responded to? And I'm like, well, this book doesn't have exactly those things. I'm really, I'm really worried about this. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm worried that I'm not going to give people what they actually wanted. But I couldn't, I couldn't untangle that feeling from this book just sucks and I can't connect with it because I didn't have any experience doing it. Yeah. So until I hit the third attempt and it felt different, I couldn't identify the difference between those two feelings. I still felt, you know, uh, continuing horror that people just won't like the book <laughs> for whatever reason. But it was different from the understanding that I had on the previous attempts that the book was just wrong, that I was not, that it was like not, it wasn't genuine or it wasn't, Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, 
something that wasn't that was personally relatable to me was not being articulated in the book. Something that I could connect right. to. That's like that's me sticking out my finger to touch somebody else's finger. Oh, we have this point of connection. There's this thing that we both understand that makes this story work. Um, and so I didn't figure that out until the third try. Hopefully, it will be easier after that. Um. Writing it after that, I think, took me about a month and a half. Um, I sat down the same way I did before. I treated mm -hmm. it like a national novel writing month again, and I did my, it just took me longer than a month. Um, <laughs> and it's a little longer than the previous book, so that makes sense. It was like, it's like 20-something thousand words longer than the previous book. Mm -hmm. um, but I got it written. Um, but yeah, it was, it, was, it was harrowing for a while. Um, um, and they would have let me miss the date. They would have they would have been perfectly fine with it, but I'm mm -hmm. not wired to do that. I've spent too long shipping things, and yeah. the dates are immovable, and there's this huge financial fallout if you don't do right. it, or like everybody gets fired. So <laughs> I don't work that way. So I I got it done on time. Um, what I did again was I actually pre-edited the book before I gave it to them too. I used the same editor that I worked with last time because mm -hmm. we understood each other. She knew the book. She had been through the previous book. She understood, and we're, we just are pretty much on the same wavelength as far as yeah. like, what's like important to a story, what's important works. for the characters, and we know each other. So we did a pre-edit. So we did the whole edit ahead of time and then submitted it to the door. And they knew this. Beautiful. They were okay with it before I did it. They, they were fine with it. I mean, mm -hmm. why wouldn't they be? Somebody else wants to edit the book first? Great. We're still <laughs> going to edit it, but it's less work less for work us. Less work for us, yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and then, so I got it to them before, before I went on book tour in November, before the relaunch. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and then it went well, they, they liked the book. Um, and, uh, the edit process went pretty fast, fast, I think for their standards, because a, I'd already edited and two, I don't sit on anything. So <laughs> they gave me their first like editorial suggestions and I turned them around in like under 24 hours. I was like, okay, yeah. we're going like, to do this. Let's get it done. Left. Let's go. And they were like, what, what the fuck they are you doing? Don't understand. What the Travis fuck are you doing? Intensity. You have a month. What, what, what? what? I, I, I'm not going to do anything with this right now. <laughs> yeah, but why so, wait a month? God, I love it. But why wait a month? Yeah. I, I got to do it now. Mm -hmm. For me, it's like, um. Like you can see, once you've finished writing, at least for me, I can kind of like see the landscape of the story still in my brain and it gets foggier and foggier and foggier the further away from it I get. The longer you wait. So if I, if I change something here and I still have it fresh, I understand what it needs to do over here. Right. But the more distant, it's like I lose, I lose an idea of how things affect each other. So I just mm -hmm. want to act now. Um, anyway, but it went fine. There, the, we didn't really do much to it. It was, it was, you know, kind of standard editorial stuff. No big yeah. changes. The book is still the same book. Uh, did we even add any? Uh, did we even add anything? Uh, I feel like we may have exp <laughs> maybe expanded a conversation. I forget now. We didn't add much of anything if we added anything. Wow, it was yeah. pretty much the book. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and then... You know, everybody goes on vacation and whatever for Christmas, but yeah, it just went off to copy edits because I had some last edits and I had some like gamma readers that came in with a few last little things and mm -hmm. did some tweaks over Christmas and now it's basically done. Dude, um, well, uh, congratulations on that. I mean, I'm really excited for, for the second book and, uh, you know, I think... MJ had a, a few Spitfire questions for you before we close things up. Now that I've chewed up every last second of this thing by just <laughs> fucking rambling. Oh, Dude, no, it's perfect. this has been great. You, this has been you fascinating. Have, yeah. You have a beautiful voice, and we love to listen, <laughs> so it's all good. It's the, uh, it's the microphone. <laughs> Makes me sound It's a beautiful so setup. <laughs> <laughs> well, these questions are supposed to be Spitfire, so no worries. Okay, fast. Do it fucking fast. First, yeah, without <laughs> thinking. No, you can think. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> first of all, Okay, from Legends and Lattes, who is your favorite character? And you can't say all of them. That's a cheat. That's my answer, though. That's my actual fucking answer. But if I have to pick, it's Tandry. If I have okay. to pick, it's Tandry. I also love Tandry. All right, second one. What is your favorite coffee shop? Do you have like a local one that you love or a chain or something? Uh, the local one, one in Spokane early. that I love is Atticus. So um, there's a, 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 it's named after uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Anyway, it's an awesome coffee shop. Love nice. it. And lastly, what is your regular coffee order? It's a, uh, well, if, I, if I'm making it myself and or if I can get it, it's a mezzo mezzo, which is uh, a little bit of uh, sugar in the bottom of the cup and you steam it. And then you add basically uh, an Americano 
and then one shot of espresso, and then a little steamed milk. Wow. That's really good. I've never heard of a mezzo mezzo. <laughs> no, me neither. It's probably I, it's some some barista made it for me back <laughs> in in Seattle, and I've always loved it ever since. It's like just the right balance. It's just the right size, not too yeah. much milk. You know, it's got two shots, but it's also got a little water for volume and a tiny bit of sweet. It's just perfect. Yeah, that's brilliant. Good balance. All I right. love it. Cool. Awesome. Well, to close out, I would like you to give listeners and viewers a a good nugget of soundbite writing advice, and b to tell me a weird or random fact that you find to be utterly fascinating. Uh, so writing advice. Gosh, I feel so fucking unqualified to give any of this, but, um, <laughs> leave out the boring parts. And what was the other Good question? Advice. I've already forgotten it. <laughs> a weird or random fact that you find to be fascinating. A weird or random fact that I find to be fascinating. Um, I just saw on Twitter today, somebody was saying like really disturbing facts that you wish you didn't know. Apparently your <laughs> intestines like know where they're supposed to be. So when, if you have like, if you're like in surgery and they take your intestines back out, when they just slop them back in there, but they, because they know your intestines will just move back to where they're supposed to be. Wow. Okay. That is, I mean, that makes weird sense. And fascinating. Cause my, my <laughs> wife is pregnant right now. And it's like when you're pregnant too, it's like the whole oh, crazy yeah, they all move expansion. Around. Everything. And, mm-hmm. and all the organs get pushed <laughs> to weird places. And then when they when the baby's out, everything goes back to where it was. It goes mostly. back to where it's supposed to be. They're little homing <laughs> the beacons. Part. They go home. Just leave on a really <laughs> disturbing random fact. Yeah. In, <laughs> intestines. Enjoy, everybody. I love it. <laughs> Travis, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Thank As you. As well for anyone who contributes to our Patreon at $10 or more a month, there will be a special treat. Uh, Travis is going to do an exclusive reading from Bookshops and Bone Dust, so go check that out. And Travis, where can people find you on social media? It's pretty much at Travis Baldry everywhere, but mostly I'm on Twitter. Perfect. And on Instagram. Exactly. He's got some And I am on Instagram, Instagram and TikTok and whatever, but, you know, <laughs> Twitter is easy. <laughs> it's easy. Right. And you can also follow SFF Addicts on Instagram and Twitter, at SFF Addicts Pod. You can follow me. At Adrian M. Gibson. MJ, where can people find you? Um, you can find me at MJ Coon Books, also everywhere. <laughs> so that's it for this episode. Stay tuned next week for part two with Travis to hear our mini masterclass on audiobook narration. Now, keep reading, keep imagining, and we'll see you next time on SFF Addicts. <laughs>